goodness, what a wonderful song. What a wonderful song. Thanks, sister. Some, some through the fire, some through the flood, some through the water, but all through the blood. Amen. Amen. My goodness, I don't write songs like that much anymore. All right. All right. We're going to settle down and get in the book. Take your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. There's a lot of preachers that are preaching messages on, on the time that we're living in, especially because of the uh, tragic things we've seen lately. And I have been too. And uh, so I want to uh, do one more on it this morning, maybe for, for now, and um, mention a few things today. Now, I want to preach this morning on the subject, how you can make it. How you can make it. My heart was broke yesterday morning as I was on the phone with Miss, Miss Patricia Edwards. They'll be here to sing Saturday night, Lord willing. And she was telling me they live in Burnsville. And she was telling me that the, uh, uh, the, the suicide rate was gone unbelievably in those mountains. And that's for people that have no hope, worked all their life for something and lost it all. And that's not the right thing to do. There's hope. There's hope. My privilege this morning is to tell you, you can make it and there's hope, whatever situation you're in. All you folks that watch from online, listen, they, they, they'd love to be here and be in your shoes, um, but they're not. If they can hear me, there's hope for you. First Timothy chapter 3 and look at verse number 13. Here's how you can make it in these last days. 1 Timothy 3, 6, 13. Um, I'm sorry, that's 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, I'm sorry. My bad. 2 Timothy 3 and verse number 13. 1 Timothy 3, 13. My bad again. I was right to start with. All right. Um, here in the Bible, in whatever book you think it might be in, you might look up and find it. 13, 2 Timothy 3, 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. That means there ain't going to be no worldwide revival and turning to God like TV preachers said. That ain't going to happen. Now, there will be during the Great Tribulation. There will be. Uh, there will be multitudes saved out of every nation in the world. But in this age you and I are living in, it's like this, brother. It's going to be worse and worse. Look at 14. Here's what you got to do. Here's what I got to do. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned. You know what that's basically saying? You just keep right on going the way you're going, believing what you believe, trusting what you've always trusted in. They ain't come out with nothing no better than what we got right here. Now, these pictures of Mars just absolutely make me life my head off. Pictures of Mars. Who are they trying? Look at this stunning blue rocks on Mars. You, you really expect people to believe that. Uh, uh, I mean, you might believe it. You're brainwashed. They ain't no pictures of Mars. You close up rocks. Uh, but anyway, keep on believing what you've always believed. They're going to find something with the help of AI and Project Blue Beam to prove the Bible ain't true. You wait and see. But it won't be real proof. It'll be a false proof. You know what the Bible calls that? Strong delusion. Strong. Not just delusion. Strong delusion. Where if you didn't know, and you wasn't rooted and grounded, and you didn't have your feet on the rock, and you didn't know what you believe and why you believe it, you'd be deceived. That's right. That's right. They think they're going to come out with some scientific discoveries that prove there's no way the Bible could be true. But it's false. False science. So here's what me and you got to do. You keep right on believing what you believe from the moment you were saved to right now. This book right here, brother, will stand when the blessed world's on fire. Come heaven and earth shall pass away. NASA and Washington, D.C. will pass away. Amen. Uh, the goodwill and the politicians and the Democrats and Republicans will pass away. But the Lord said, my word shall stand forever. 
forever. That's why the old song says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. No doubt there's here those this morning, maybe watching from riding up the road in a truck or maybe in jail. or uh, People actually watch our services in prison. Uh, they're not supposed to have a phone, but they, they somehow or another, I get letters from them, and they're watching, and um, uh, they're saying, they're saying, uh, I need hope. I need hope. There's people all the way up in the mountains from right over there, all around, right up 25 miles from here, that think, no hope. There's no hope. I've worked all my life. My homeowner's insurance won't cover my house much because I'm 80 years old. I bought the cows and the horses and the barns and everything gone down the river. My house ain't even there no more. I'm, I'm 65. I'm 70. I'm, hey, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I got good news for you this morning. I'm going to tell you how you can have hope. Now, let me just say a few things about it this morning. And first thing I want to say is, here's my advice to you. You need courage that does not fail. You need courage that does not fail. These are no time to chicken out, folks. These are no times to bow down to the, the idols of Hollywood and God and the Russians and the Chinese and the, the government. This is no time for us to be given up. This is no time for us to be given in. This is no time for us to be uh, throwing in the towel. This is no time to say, well, I, I just I just don't know, Brother Danny. I, where, was, where was God? Where was God? Uh, uh, Brother Danny, where was God? Uh, this is no time to question God. Ladies and gentlemen, God don't make any mistakes. What they're saying now that this is the worst storm that's ever, ever hit the Appalachian Mountains. Ever. That they know about. There might have been one in between Noah's flood and this. That was before they started keeping records in 1800s. But that they know about. Now you can know for sure by looking at them mountains. Something mighty, mighty bad happened there before. Uh, you know that. But this is the uh, worst storm that's ever happened. Now everything you can see is a picture of something you can't see. And just as sure as those flood waters come and destroyed homes and life, you can mark it down. The flood waters of sin and filth and wickedness are ruining homes, ruining individuals' lives, ruining and taking people to hell and destroying people forever and ever and ever. You can you can bet on that. I guarantee it. Our bus kids this morning, all those kids that came on buses, a, a bunch of them back here in, in junior church, a bunch of them in here today. They need to grow up knowing. I have hope. I've got something I can believe in. I got somebody I can trust in. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. Through many dangers, tolls, and snares, the Lord's kept this old boy right here. I've seen some good times and I've seen some bad times. My good times have far outweighed my bad times. And I'm going to tell you this morning, no matter how bad it gets, you listen to me? No matter how bad it gets, no matter how discouraged you are, no matter how rough the road may get, no matter how deep the water, how high the mountain, our God in heaven is still there on his throne today. He's able to do what he could ever do. God's not, God's not worried. God's not scared. He's still there today. Thank God. Hallelujah. Thank God he's still there. You need courage to face this old world. You know, I think about David fighting that giant. And that David come out there that day, and they say that he's a teenager. They, Bible scholars, say David was probably 17, 18 years old. I don't know that. That's what they say. And he was just a young stripling. Uh, and he come out, a little young boy, and there stood Goliath. And I, I don't believe Goliath was nine and a half foot tall, like they tell you. I believe he's probably 12. Probably 13, depending on their definition of a cubic and a span. The Egyptian cubic was a lot bigger than ours. Ours is from there to there, usually 18 inches. But uh, their, their definition, so anyway, any way you look at it, guy had arms probably, probably that big around. He probably wore a size 58 shoe. Uh, I mean, he, if he, sandal, whatever he had on. And his, he probably may have been high as that ceiling right there. And David was up against him. Now, you know, there's no humanly way possible David could fight that giant. Humanly speaking, that giant could have picked up David with one hand and squeezed him while he was drinking a cup of coffee. He has no way to win. Now, that's the situation a lot of people are in. We can't fight him. We can't do this. I can't do this no more. I, I, it's too much. The, the battle's too rough. The, 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 the days are too dark. I don't, the money's just not here. 
I can't pay my bills. I've lost my bills. That's, that's Dave. You're David. That's all he's saying are the giant. But you remember what David said. David said, I remember when I, the lion came after me and the Lord came on me and I helped him. Remember when the bear came after me and the Lord helped me and I killed him. And he said, you, this guy is going to be just like that lion and that bear. He said, you come to me with a sword and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. That's what we got to do. Listen, people, I don't know what we may be facing. I, have, I, I know uh, I've heard uh, Ralph Sexton said the other night, uh, at the tent revival and you know like sometimes I'll have to turn the, turn the cameras off have a personal talk with the congregation Ralph uh, did that to the night congregation he mentioned some things about you are now you are now being being tracked if you use certain words on, on your phone if you text or use certain words it puts a flag up you and eventually eventually it's already being done that if you purchase a Bible your name will be put on a list if you uh, say anything about Jesus Christ in a positive way, not cussing, your name will be put on a list, and eventually you will be looked at as an enemy of, of uh, progress, and you'll be flagged. Now, that's where it's coming to. We're like the Hebrew children. The Hebrew children was there. All them stories in the Bible, God put in there, so it means you could read them and have hope. And God, David knocked that guy's brains out. The Hebrew children stood over there. They said, you're going to burn. They said, well, I I, we don't want to burn, but if we have to, we have to. We're not going to deny the Lord. And they threw them in there, and the Lord was with them. That's where we may wind up. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we are at the tipping point. Everybody knows we're at some kind of crossroads in, in history. Our country here in uh, two, three weeks from Tuesday will make a major, major decision on the direction our country's going to go in the next few years. And you suppose some people are just saying, I'm just giving up. I'm just giving up. I have no hope. I'm telling you, you got to have courage that does not fail. When you remember this. You remember this. You can't keep your heart beating all night. You go to sleep. You trust the Lord to keep your heart beating. You, you, you're going to heaven when you die. You trust the Lord to take that. If we can trust Him to keep our heart beating, trust Him to take us to heaven when we die, we can trust Him to get us through the mess that we're in now. Courage that does not fail. Number two, you must have Christians who are friends. Now that means this. You've heard me say it and other preachers a hundred times, especially all the young people. I can tell you what you are, what you will be by the people you hang around. Birds of a feather, brother, flock together. And you make up your mind, you know how you're going to make it? You're going to find the right kind of people and you're going to be around the right crowd. I heard about a young man. We was in prayer meeting one night, and one of the young men, he had some friends that wanted to go out to a club. And his buddies were saying, let's go to the club, man, let's go. Let's have a party, have a party. And he knew they was going to be doing things at that party that wasn't right. And he said, uh, somebody called him, said, hey, we're having prayer meeting at church tonight. And he dropped off his friends and came to prayer meeting. And that night made a difference in the way that boy went. Just one choice. He could have been at his friend's house at a party and he'd come to church and come to prayer meet. That one night made a difference in that young man's life. Just that one decision, just that one church service, just that one uh, prayer meet, just that one camp meeting could tell the difference. Your Christian friends, your Christian friend. The Bible puts it like this. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. That means, you want me to tell you in redneck language, you hang around crazy people, you'll be crazy. That's right. You hang around smart people, you'll get smarter. You hang around people smarter than you, you'll get smarter. You hang around dumber people, you'll be dumb, you're dumb and they'll be dumber. And you know, by the time y'all get through this, that's plain, you can understand that, right? Can't you get that? Look, you, you are, I can tell you what you are or what you will be by the people that you run around. I heard about a story of a young man, uh, this guy, he's trying to date this girl, and her daddy didn't want him to, and uh, this has been years and years ago, like back in the 60s, 70s, and the daddy didn't want him to date this girl, and he come there, he said, boy, you got off my property, and if I ever see you here again, I'm calling the cops, uh, I, and then that guy got out of there, he took off, he was so mad, he hated that man so bad, he said they took his car, and he said uh, they, they would go down back up in that man's driveway. And when they back up in that man's driveway, they'd blow the horn real loud 
and hit the gas and spin rocks, sling them all up against his house and everything, and speed off down the road. They've done that two or three times. That old guy had all he could take of that. And one night, he was out there in the bushes waiting with a gun. He had a rifle, and he's hid in the bushes. He said, they come do that again. I'm not going to let them destroy my property like that. And then boys were riding around town, and they pulled over and picked up a 14-year-old boy. And he said, where y'all going? Ah, we're just out riding around. Come on. And that 14-year-old boy got in the car with those, those other, other guys. They rode around the block a few times, and, you know, they was trying to smoke a little weed and get high and cut up. And they said, hey, let's go up to old man's house and bother him again. And that young boy was with them. They backed up in that man's driveway. He saw him coming. He done had to bead on that, that back window of that car. And then when he backed up in there, they, they started spinning wheels and he fired. That bullet went through that back window of that car and right into the head of that 14 year old boy. He never had been there. He had no idea that was going to happen. He went to eternity just by one choice that he made to be around people he wasn't supposed to be around. There are thousands of stories like that. You hang around people that'll get you in trouble, you will get in trouble. You know, if you're with somebody and they get stopped or something, you can be a part of a crime or in a car, or, or maybe you're a driver and somebody got something in the car that you ain't, they ain't supposed to have and you have a wreck or you hit somebody. Do you realize that? Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to have Christians who are friends. Amen. You sure better. Somebody said it like this. Uh, uh, they said, uh, um, you started today on life's journey. This is for the young men. Uh, you're alone on the highway of life. You'll meet a thousand temptations. Each city is filled with riot. The world is a stage of excitement. There's uh, danger around everywhere you go. But if you're true to your manhood, have courage, my boy, and say no. You got to learn how to say no. You got to learn how to say, nope, I'm not going. Well, they'll make fun of me. Let them make fun of me. They'll call you chicken. So let them come call what they want to. That's right. That's right. Let them say what they want to. Your life is more important. Your testimony is more important. I'm telling you, young ladies, that boy tries to get you to go somewhere or do something that's not right. Tell him to go jump in the lake and swallow a snake. Come back up with the bellyache. That's what mom said to do. That's right, brother. And you say, well, I love him. Yeah, well, he loves himself. That's his problem. And I'm telling you tonight, this morning, you better remember tonight, every night this week, you're going to make a choice. You make choices every day that determines which way your life goes make sure you have christians as your friends number three we have courage that don't fail we have christians who are friends number three you want to have closeness in your family you got to have family around you i feel sorry for people that don't have any family there's a lot of them. make sure you have closeness in the family man wife kid closeness in the family you need it bad. You need it bad. You say, well, Brother Danny, my mom, I know, I know there are exceptions. There are situations where it's impossible for families to be together. I understand that. Some people have that. There's probably some here today like that. But if you're just griping and bellyaching at each other, I encourage you today, get close to your family. Forgive each other. You're going to have arguments. You're going to have disagreements. We're like church. We're a big, we're a big family here. You're going to have stuff that happens you don't like. I, I, something happens I don't like every Sunday. But I've learned that this is my family. This is my family. We got to have closeness in our family. We got to learn. You know what you got to have in a family? You kids going to have to learn how to forgive your parents. Your parents are going to have to learn how to forgive your kids. Your husband's going to have to learn how to uh, uh, love your wife. Your, your wives love and respect their husband. You've got to have closeness in the family. I'll never forget uh, when I was out one night with these boys after a, after a ball game. I was much younger. I think I was 14. And I was out with these guys. They were 17 and 18. And we'd come down Highway 70 and turn up Hoppeton, the road I live on. And they put reached under the seat and they pulled out a six-pack of beer. And they started giving everybody one. And I was sitting in the back seat like this, and they handed me a beer. And I'd never touched a beer in my life. I'd saw what it done to my daddy. And I'd saw what it done to my uncles. And I saw, and I, I don't want that stuff. And I wasn't saved. I didn't get saved when I was 18. But I remember seeing my daddy lay drunk in the bed for two, two weeks. 
and lost everything. And my daddy did not be, you think I'm bad, brother, he, he'd work two shifts and sell and, and go coon hunting all night, really. And I, that, it knocked him down. And I remember many times he had those brown marks on his, on his finger right there. And mom had to come in there because she's afraid he'd go drop a cigarette on the carpet and burn the house down. And my sister sitting right over there this morning, she can tell you, Daddy, he was a good man. He worked hard and everything, but he had, a, he had an alcohol problem. And let me tell you, you say, boy, I don't ever want to get like that. i tell you how not to get like that. Don't touch it. Not, not, not wine, not beer, not any alcoholic beer. Alcohol is not made for pleasure, people. You listen to me? You say, I can handle it. That's what he said. He said, I can handle it. That's what my Uncle Nail said. And I had to cut his feet off, uh, his legs off from right here down, where he froze, nearly froze to death up here in spruce pine and the snow. And he found the snow, and, the, and, he, and he, they had to cut it off because his feet turned black. That's what he said. You better learn how to make some right decisions. And I could hear my mom. She preached to us all the time. At that time, I was playing in a rock band, and we played when I was 14. And I was playing over at the Lake Club on the, on the Lake James, the Marion Lake Club. And I was playing guitar like that, and I watched some people. They about made me sick. I saw school teachers out there dancing around with these different people's wives and staggering around like that. And I thought, God. I was so young that it, I, I was scared of it. And I sat there that, that night with that beer in my hand. I, you know what I should have done? I should have said, uh, you can let me out right here. You know why I didn't? I didn't have enough guts to do it. You know why you give in to sexual pressure? You know why you give in to smoking a joint? You don't have the guts to turn it down. You ain't man enough or woman enough to stand up and say no. But I tell you one thing, brother. When I got saved, God put something in me that's helped, helped me do that. Hey, no, nobody offers me a beer anymore. I don't remember the last time I was offered a beer. Well, I do, too. I was out visiting one day. And, uh, you know, when you first started visiting... Uh, I remember going to trailer parks, and if somebody's drinking, they said, "Here's a preacher." They'd set it down over here beside, the, and 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 hope you didn't smell them, because I'd smell it near that pulpit. And uh, now, then a few years later, they'll sit there and drink it in front of him. Say, "You on beer, preacher?" And I say, "No, I don't." You know why they do that? Because there's so many wicked preachers that do take it. They've lowered the standard. But I sat there that night, and I looked at that thing, and I went, pop! And I put it up to my lips, went down like that. Didn't touch it. Put it up to my lips, touch it like that. In a few minutes, I know, they was all finished, and theirs up, and I rolled down the window and thoop, threw the whole thing out. I wanted them, I didn't want them to think that I wasn't brave enough to do what they wanted to do. Isn't that sad? What a pitiful excuse for a man. A man that would let other people tell him what to drink and what not to. What a sorry. I was a pitiful excuse for a human being. Didn't have enough gut. But you know what I'd do if I had could today? I'd pour every bit of it in the sewer. All of it in the whole world. And shout while I did it. And God would say, Amen, Brother Daddy. That's what I do now. I rolled the window real quick. Because there's, you know, you, when an empty beer can hit you, ding, 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 mine went, don't. <laughs> I didn't want to hear it. I was ashamed. You know what I did? You know what I say? Listen, you got to have courage, brother. You got to have Christian friends. You got to have close. You know why I did that? My mom preached to me. She's blue in the face. My mom, no doubt, humanly speaking, is the reason I'm not in hell at this point. I'm going to say to all you young people here, if you got a good mama, you got a good daddy? He said, well, they, they gave me a spanking. Well, I'm sure you didn't get as many as you deserved. I didn't. I didn't. Amen. He said, people don't believe in spanking no more, preacher. Yeah, I know. And ain't we got a bunch of well-behaved young people now? Boy, that's really working good, ain't it? <laughs> Most well-behaved group of young people in the world. Oh, yeah, good night. Somebody put it like this, one of my favorite poems. Junior bit the meter man. Junior kicked the cook. See, he'd been reading Dr. Spock's the parents had. Junior's antisocial now, according to the book. Junior smashed the clock and a lamp. Junior hacked a tree. Destructive trends are treated in chapters two and three. 
Junior threw his milk at mom. Junior cried for more. Those notes on self-assertiveness, they're found in chapter 4. Junior got in grandpa's room, tore up his fishing line. That's just to gain attention. See page 89. But grandpa grabbed a belt and yanked Junior across his knee because grandpa ain't read a book since 1893. That's what's wrong with our generation, kids. That's right. That's right. It ain't going to kill them. It'll keep them getting killed one of these days. Amen. Uh, you need closeness in the family. Finally, I'll say this and I'm through. You need confidence in the future. You need confidence. In, do we have anything to believe in? Sure we do. If Look, if you don't have the Lord, what do you got? You just hope for the best. Hope for the best. Do the best you can and hope you don't get cancer. That's all you can do. Hope you don't get killed in a car or have a heart attack. That's all. But we have confidence in the future. That's why we can spend our time like we do. The reason I spend my time like I do is because I believe that God has a rest for us up there. And we'll have plenty of time to relax and, and enjoy the thing, whatever we need to do up there. We work, I worked, a, a, I see, at least 14 hour. 16-hour day, Thursday and Friday. We started in the morning, didn't quit till 10.30 at night. Do that all the time. You know what? You know how come I didn't just go loafer and try? You can't even go see the leaves. No way. They'll be all right maybe this week. You know why? Because I believe that if I do use my time doing something for the Lord and helping other people, I'll have billions of years to rest and enjoy God and the things that God. I have confidence in the future. In other words, I'm not just living for now. Now we can have fun. We can enjoy life. We can eat. We can have pleasure and all that kind of stuff. Nothing wrong with that. But I'm telling you, you better have some confidence in what's coming after this life. And that's courage. In courage alone lies your safety when the long journey you begin. And trust in your Heavenly Father who will keep you unspotted from sin. Temptation's going to go on increasing as streams from a river do flow. But if you're true to your manhood, have courage, my boy, to say no. The harlot's sweet smile may allure you. Beware of her cunning and art. Whenever you see her approaching, be guarded and haste to depart. The bars and the clubs are inviting, decked out in their tinsel and show. And if you're invited to enter, have courage, my boy, say no. What about this... Uh, girl, lady, by the name of Charlotte Elliott. And she lived over 100 years ago. And Charlotte got bitter. She had a physical handicap, and she got mad and hated everybody. And they'd try to talk to her about God, and she said, I don't know if there is a God, but if there is, I hate him for what he's done to me. And she blamed God for all of her problems. And she had bad health. And she got discouraged and, and just to the point where she said, she said, if God cared about me, why did he let this happen? If God loves me, why am I having to go through this? Where is he at? If he's God, he's sure a very good one. Look what I'm going through. And a preacher came to visit their house. And he sat down at the table. And at the table, this is a true story. Uh, the preacher's name was Caesar Melon. And he came to try to help her. And they sat down to eat dinner that day. And as they're sitting around to eat dinner, somebody said something about God, and Charlotte just blurted out a blankety blank. I'm tired. Don't talk to me about that God business. God, my foot. Look at the mess I'm in. Where's God? We're at. And it embarrassed her family so much. They got up and walked out of the room. And that just left the preacher and her. And he's just staring at her. And he said, You know what's wrong with you? She said, No, what? He said, You're holding on to hate. And bitterness, and that's all you've got. That's all you have. She said, well, what else is there? He said, the hate and bitterness that you have toward God, is the, that's the very thing you need, is what you're hating. The Bible said the haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves to him. Back there in Psalms, I think. And so she began to listen. And he said, all right, I'll tell you what you can do. You can come to the Lord right now, and he'll save you. Right now, this day, she said, "How?" Do I, he said, Look, "The way I am." He said, "That's right. You come just like you are, and she, without her fightings, with inner fears, like you're all messed up." She said, "I can come to him just like I am." He said, "Yes." Long story short, the Holy Spirit settled down in there, and Charlotte got saved. 
She got saved, and her brother turned into a preacher, and or trying to help help people like like in crisis and like flood like flood victim and stuff like that. And years and years and years went by. She held on to John six thirty seven, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And she never forgot the words of that preacher. And they was raising money years later to help kids in orphanages and feed these kids and give them something to eat. And she wrote a, she, she made little trinkets for them to give out and, and sell for this event. And she wrote a poem. Let me tell you what the words of that poem was. Come to the Lord. And she wrote this poem. Just as I am without one plea. But that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God. I can't she wrote that. Just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Get that ready for us, brother. Maybe you're here this morning. You know, listen, that song has been used to the invitation to see more people saved than any other song that's ever been written in the history of the world. And it was written by a young lady who at one time was mad at God, but she realized he is the best friend she could ever have. You know how you're going to make it? Quit fighting the Lord, friend. The last thing you need to do is go get drunk. That's the last thing you need to do. What you need to do is turn to Jesus with all your heart. And I say that to everybody, all of our church members, everybody, whatever's eating you, whatever's bugging you, whatever's bothering you, whatever the devil's using on you, give it to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm just giving this to you. I ain't, no, I ain't gonna hold on to this. Let's do that this morning. Let's all stand, please. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. We're gonna sing that well loved.